Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Whether you are looking for weekly Bible studies, in-depth courses, or talks related to the faith, you will find it at the ICC. Please check out our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. All are welcome to join our growing international ICC family. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or app. Our speaker this evening is our own founding executive director of the Institute of Catholic Culture. Father Hezekiah Carnazzo graduated from Christendom College in 2004 and completed a master's degree in systematic theology with an advanced apostolic catechetical diploma at Christendom's graduate school. In 2009, Father Hezekiah founded the Institute of Catholic Culture and has since served as its executive director. Ordained to the priesthood in 2016, he also serves as director of the Office of Catechesis and Evangelization for the Melkite Greek Catholic Eparchy of Newton. Father Hezekiah has lectured throughout the United States. He's a regular guest on the Sunrise Morning Show and has appeared on EWTN Sunday Night Live and Marcus Grodi's Coming Home Network. He also hosts his own radio show on the Guadalupe Radio Network, Face to Face with the Institute of Catholic Culture and he serves as pastor of St. George Melkite Greek Catholic Church in Sacramento, California. He and his wife, Linda, have seven children. It is a pleasure to welcome as an official speaker this evening, Father Hezekiah Scarnazzo. Thank you, Peter. And we also have, uh, we're going to be doing a little co-teaching tonight, uh, Amy Giuliano. Many of you may not know Amy. Amy, say hello. Hello. Good to, <laughs> good, good to have you, Amy. Amy is our is our um, is our kind of media uh, expert guru at the ICC. She actually is a as a as a full time member of our staff, but she is also um, a uh, an art historian. She holds degrees in philosophy from France, theology from Rome, an art history from Yale, as well as undergraduate degrees in Catholic studies. So she's uh, she's an amazing gift to our ICC team. And hopefully in the coming year and years, she's going to be doing more and more with us in art and architecture. Um, as Peter was mentioning, we have our, our upcoming talk on the Pieta during Lent, which uh, um, it's on, is that on Palm Sunday, I do believe. Yes, Peter? Um, yep. Yeah, wonderful. So our Palm Sunday uh, event, she gets the big one this year, and uh, we'll be doing that with us. But Amy's going to come in and participate as a kind of a co-teacher uh, in the second half of our time together. Um, so, so with that, let's, let's begin in prayer, guys. I'm going to, um, I'm going to begin with the prayer of St. Ephraim that, um, is prayed in the Byzantine East, uh, before the proclamation of the gospel by the priest. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. O master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your eternal Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you have you with us. Those are new to the ICC. Those have been with us for a long time. As we mentioned, we're going to be doing this talk in two parts, two 35, 40-minute segments. Um, the first segment is going to be the heady part, okay? We're going to get into some theology. I have some extended quotations to share with you. So uh, get out your notebooks, get out your pens. You got your Bibles, Catholics? We're going to dive deeply into them tonight. According to the Fathers, the Apostolic Mind, um, the early church and an understanding of what takes place 
when we are baptized into Christ. Yeah, the title of our of our of our evening this evening this evening is encountering Christ, mystagogy, and the life of the church. Now, you probably looking at the title probably. Thinking, I have no idea what this guy is going to talk about. Well, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about baptism in light of the fact that we just celebrated the baptism of Christ. Yes. And more than just baptism, what baptism does to us and how our encounter with Christ in baptism changes our entire life. According to the mind of the fathers of the church, according to an apostolic vision of what takes place when we are baptized. And my brothers and sisters, I dare say that the mind of the fathers is far from the mind of many Christians today. And if we understood, and God willing, we will understand tonight how the early Christians understood what took place on the day of their baptism, I dare say that our entire life as Christians would change. And I hope this evening tonight will be an opportunity for a life-changing moment for us as baptized Christians and those that are joining us that are not baptized into Christ. Let's begin by defining our terms. It's a good place to start. Mystagogy is probably the most difficult word we're going to encounter tonight. So let's just dive into that one right now. It is a combination uh, uh, coming together of two Greek words. The first one, if you're taking notes, write this down, mysteria, M-Y-S-T-E-R-I-A. So here we go, mysteria. I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to comment a little bit on it. Um, They kind of say, a secret right or doctrine. In its ancient usage, it is a word that refers to that which is known secretly or known by certain initiated persons. Now, that's me writing that part of it, okay? All right. Now, this is important because it's not a word which, which refers to something which is not knowable, right? So when we, we're talking about mystery, oftentimes we think it's something which is not known. This is not a Christian understanding of the word mystery. It is not something which is not known, but rather it is something which is known to certain people who have been initiated into the group which knows. Okay? And again, I'm talking in secular terms. We're going to apply this to a Christian understanding. The second second word that is used here in Greek is agian, A-G-E-I-N, agian, A-G-E-I-N. To lead, or agogos, to uh, the leader, one who leads. So mystagogy is the process of being led into the mystery. The process of being initiated into coming to know that which was not known previously. Mystagogical catechesis is the process by which one is led into the mysteries of the faith, Or we might say the process by which one who has been initiated comes to understand the meaning of baptism. What just happened? Yeah, look, we have a a, a bad process in the RCIA business in the church today. And that is the RCIA business is a matter of making theologians out of people. Yeah, you hand them the catechism of the Catholic church, okay? And you beat them over the head with it for an entire year until they can pass their test. And having come to be smart enough about theology stuff, or at least can repeat certain definitions, then we agree to initiate them. This is contrary to the apostolic practice of Christian initiation. In fact, if you read in your opening pages of your catechism, it says very clearly that this is a theological work, a deep theological work. And it's used by the catechist, but not really to be used by the catechumen. That's too much for them. It was the practice in the early church that the one who was to be baptized was prepared by coming to know kind of the literal historical interactions of salvation history. Yeah, They come to know salvation history. In fact, one of the churches we're going to look at tonight Um the doors of the baptistry are depicted with all of the stories of salvation history, the doors, right? Because you had to come to know that what God has done in order to understand what God is going to do to me in my life. And so mystagogical catechesis begins before baptism. I should say this, 
the catechesis of the person begins before baptism by becoming familiar with the facts of salvation history, yes? But then the mystagogical catechesis takes place on the day of baptism in which the person who is newly initiated is told now what life is like in Christ. Before that, the catechumen didn't really know so much about what was going to happen to them on the day of their baptism. They didn't know much about receiving the Eucharist. It was only after being initiated in the church, having been plunged in the water of baptism, that their eyes are open, that they can now see and then begin to understand what normally we do with people for an entire year in our CIA. Okay? So the mystagogical catechesis is that catechesis which takes place upon coming out of the waters of baptism, that we can now enter into the mystery and see a newness of life which has been given to us in Christ. Now, I am off my notes completely for the, probably the one of the 15th time it will happen tonight. So I'm going to get back to my notes for just a second because I don't want to miss anything. Mystagogical catechesis, the process by which one is led to the mysteries of the faith, or you might say the process by which one who has been initiated comes to understand the meaning of what has happened in the fullness of life in Christ. Myst, the word mystery or mysterium is loosely translated into the Latin, or at least a word is used in Latin that all of you are familiar with to replace the Greek word mystery in Latin with the word sacrament or sacramentum, which literally means what? Literally means oath or a solemn oath. Yeah, I was talking with, I'm a, as I said, I'm a Byzantine Catholic priest. I'm a married priest. I have seven children. And I was speaking with my wife last night. And I said, I was talking about this thing about mystery and oath business. And I said, well, it makes a lot of sense why they use the word sacramentum. Because if you're going to reveal a secret to somebody, if you're going to reveal something that's sacred to somebody that not just everybody knows, well, they better, they better promise that they're not going to betray it. Like if I'm going to give the key, this is what I said to her, if we're going to give the key to a neighbor, to our home, they're going to promise that they're not going to abuse that privilege, right? They're going to take an oath, if you will. And so the word sacramentum was used by the early Christians in Rome to refer to that, which was we were talking about regarding mystery. Yeah. It's not a perfect translation, but it says something about what we mean when we talk about the mysteries. We're talking about the sacraments of the church. In some way, we might say that mystagogy is the process by which one comes to understand the sacraments, or maybe even we could say is sacramental theology. But, but far from, I'm going to stop for a second, far from sacramental theology as something studied in a book, mystagogical catechesis enters the person into the mystery and allows them to come to know what the church teaches in a new way. It is not the study of something from the outside. It's very much, I've been using this lately, jumping into the fishbowl, right? We're not looking at from the outside. We're getting inside the mystery. And we are experiencing the mystery to come to understand it. Okay? Now, we are, we are created beings, yes? And we, we come, by, our, by, by God's design, we come to know reality through our senses. Yes? We come to know things through the material world. But since the truths of the faith are immaterial realities, coming to know these realities involves a different process than simple sense knowledge. It is not, as we might say in modern, uh, in modern lingo, scientific knowing, testable knowing. It's not measurable. It's not bound by time and space. It's not materially testable. It is something which pierces through our common way of knowing into what we might say is a higher mode of knowing, one which can only be understood by encounter or experience. Thus, the title for our talk tonight, Encountering Christ. And yet, we are created to come to know through sensible realities, are we not? And therefore, this type of knowing involves, for us, signs and symbols, material realities which point to a truth beyond themselves, almost like, like um, you might think of a road sign, right? A road sign is pointing to something down the road that you do not see, but it points you in the right direction that you might get there. Look, 
we are actually, I think, quite familiar with this kind of coming to know because we are not only body beings. We're not only, uh, we not only come to know and not only come to know through our senses. Well, we do only come to know through our senses. But because we are body and soul composite, because we are body and spirit, what we come to know through our senses is designed by God to lead us to a further knowledge. Yes? And I'm going I'm to use an example here for this because, because we are body, soul composite, we do this kind of thing all the time. And I think the best example for us is, uh, is love. Love is an immaterial reality. And yet we reveal that love. We show that love. We communicate that love in all sorts of sensible ways, right? Through touch, through a dozen roses, yeah? Um, through a um, through hundred thousand ways, right? A hundred thousand ways the lover shows his love to the beloved in a similar way here with the church. St. Theodore of Mopsuestia says this in his commentary on baptism. Every sacrament, mystery, consists in the representation of unseen and unspeakable things through signs and symbols. Such things require explanation and interpretation for the sake of the person who draws near to the sacraments so that he might know its power. My brothers and sisters, this is mystagogical catechesis. The study of signs and symbols, the learning of sacramental language so as to dive deeper in to the mystery of our salvation. Okay. Does that make sense? Now I want to be careful here. A little caveat. When we moderns as we are begin talking in, in terms of the immaterial, the spiritual symbols, mystery, I think we, we, we contend in the direction of what is not real. Uh, it's not scientifically testable, and therefore, it's subjective opinion. It's not real. But this is not the case at all. In fact, it is quite the opposite of that. The spiritual realities which we encounter in the sacraments are not not real or subjective. In fact, they are the most real things of all. For it is God himself who is the author of material reality, the author of our creation, that is ultimately the one whom we encounter in the sacraments. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat that. The spiritual realities which we encounter in the sacraments are not not real or subjective. In fact, they are the most real thing of all. For it is God himself who is the author of material reality, the author of our creation, that is ultimately the one whom we encounter in the sacraments. Listen, I'm going to quote a couple of times from a, a, a dear a priest friend of mine, Father Stephen Freeman. He says this, the mystery of the kingdom is real and true. Indeed, it is the ground of reality and truth. We are plunged into it in baptism and eat and drink it in the Eucharist. The whole of the Christian life is properly shaped by its presence. Our salvation is nothing other than its manifestation and revealing within us. I'm, I'm going to repeat this one also, but I'm going to repeat it with the, those words, mystery of the kingdom. And listen, listen closely to what he's saying. The mystery of the kingdom is real and true. Indeed, it is the ground of reality and truth. We are plunged into the mystery of the kingdom of God in our baptism. And we eat and drink the mystery of the kingdom of God in the Eucharist. The whole of the Christian life is properly shaped by the, the presence of the kingdom of God. Our salvation is nothing other than the kingdom of God being revealed within us. Here we begin to see what the church means when she uses the word mystagogy. She means the process of being led into the heavenly kingdom. And that leading, that process, 
for the Christian begins in holy baptism, in which we are initi initiated into a new way of life. As St. Paul says, a newness of life. And that new life that we gain in baptism is nothing short of the life of God himself. Entrance into his way of life, into his kingdom, that which we customarily call the church. I'm reminded here, I think it's good for us to go to the scriptures of the story of Nicodemus. Let's turn there for a second, okay? Get out your Bibles. John chapter 3. Now, I'm going to go back, actually, because chapter, you know, the chapter breaks are very inconvenient. They're a late edition, and sometimes they're just in the way. You know, they break a story apart. Watch, watch this. This is a good example of it. Go back up to chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, which he did. But Jesus did not trust himself. The word in the Greek, there's the same, right? M many believed in him, but he would not believe himself to them, right? He would not trust himself to them. Because he knew all men and needed no one to bear witness of man. For he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man. Do you see that? Chapter 3, verse 1, now there was a man. Now you know we've got a problem before we begin, right? Jesus, this guy is going to come and say all sorts of things, and Jesus is not going to trust him, right? Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. In the gospel of John, this is not good, right? Jesus is the light of the world. So you come at night, not good. Uh, uh, come by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know who you are. And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you are having a clue who I am, right? You don't know who I am, Nicodemus. In fact, you, Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Why? Because in order to enter into the kingdom, you must be born in Greek, anothen, to be born from above. The word in Greek has two meanings, to be born from above or to be born again. Nicodemus reveals himself as a man of the earth because he's thinking in earthly terms. Oh, God, you know, Jesus, I don't know how I can climb into my mother's womb again. You know, and unfortunately for Nicodemus, Jesus means the higher meaning of anothen, meaning to be born from above. Well, why, why is Nicodemus struggling here? Why does Nicodemus have this problem? Well, the, the, the key is given to us here in the first verse, that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. The last time we saw the Pharisees was on the bank of the Jordan River in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse 19 and following. They send representatives down to the Jordan to find out who this guy is, John the Baptist, right? They're interested, but they're standing far off. Look, turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 7 very quickly. Luke 7, verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Do you see that? The Pharisees are standing far off, refusing the baptism of John. So they come to Jesus and they say, we know who you are. And Jesus, how can you possibly know who I am? You have not been initiated into the family. You have not been baptized. And without baptism, you cannot see the kingdom. You cannot enter into the, the kingdom, Nicodemus. Get yourself right with God. Go down and be baptized. And then you can come. And only then can you come to know what you cannot know from the outside. Do you see that? One must be initiated into the kingdom of God. And let's turn that around for a moment, my brothers and sisters, to say those that have been initiated, who are now living the life given to us in holy baptism, we are given an entirely new way of seeing and understanding, namely God's way of seeing and understanding. And we are given this precisely because we what we believe happens to us in holy baptism. I oftentimes ask these, this to people that come visiting my church. And say, what happens when we're baptized? I'm going to be baptizing a baby on Sunday, God willing. And I'm going to ask this question to the group. What happens when we're baptized? And most good Catholics, knowing their catechism, will reply, original sin is washed away. At which point Father Hezekiah's head blows off. Why? Why? Because this. 
while we may be repeating a certain theological conclusion, which is true, if that theological conclusion is not based in certain biblical evidence, then the theological house we build will be built upon sand, and I don't care how well the house is built, it will come down. We must get back to the sacred scriptures as the foundation of our theological conclusions. If we hope for our theological conclusions to communicate the truth to those who we're teaching. What does the Bible say about baptism? Do you, know, do you realize that there is nowhere in the Bible that says that baptism washes away original sin? I'm not saying that's not true, but I'm saying that's a theological conclusion. What does the Bible say about baptism? Yeah, turn your Bibles. Romans chapter 6. You should memorize this text. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No. Let's stop for a second. See, Paul's hardcore, guys. He's saying... What are you doing sitting? You're a Christian. What are we to say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound by no means? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. Notice St. Paul's language there. He doesn't say we're baptized like Jesus. He says we are baptized into Jesus. Yes, to be baptized, the Greek word baptize means to be plunged. You are plunged into Jesus. You are made one with Jesus in your baptism. Yes, and when that happens, you become a participant in his life. And if we are a participant in his life, my brothers and sisters, we are a participant in the life of the one who is in perfect communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We are plunged in baptism into Christ, and in the same moment, we are plunged into the life of the Holy Trinity. And this life is what we call on earth the church. The communion of persons who have been restored in the image and likeness of God. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite quotations on this point from St. Porphyrios. Some of you have heard this before. It bears repeating. The church is without beginning, without end, and eternal. Just as the triune God, her founder, is without beginning, without end, and eternal. She is uncreated, just as God is uncreated. She existed before the ages, before the angels, before the creation of the world, before the foundation of the world. As the Apostle Paul says, she is a divine institution, and in her dwells the whole fullness of divinity. She is an expression of the richly varied wisdom of God. She is the mystery of mysteries. She was concealed and was revealed in the last times. The church remains unshaken because she's rooted in the love and wise providence of God. The three persons of the Holy Trinity constitute the eternal church. How different this is, my brothers and sisters, than the world's concept of the church. And I dare say how different this is than most Christians' concept of the church. I'm going to go back to that quote from, Saint, from, from Father Stephen Friedman from earlier. The mystery of the kingdom of God, this relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is real and true. Indeed, it is the ground of reality and truth because it is God. We are plunged into it in baptism. We eat and drink it in the Eucharist. The whole of the Christian life is properly shaped by its presence. Our salvation is nothing other than its manifestation or revealing within us. St. John tells us that God is love, and love is the pouring out of our life to the beloved. Yeah, no greater love has any man than to give his life for his friend, because this is what love is, and this is what God has lived from all eternity, and it is into this mystery that we are baptized. Now, we begin to encounter the heart of the sacraments, the holy mysteries. The sacraments are nothing more or less than our entrance into the eternal life of God himself. Listen to the catechism of the Catholic Church. In the liturgy of the church, it is principally his own paschal mystery that Christ signifies and makes present. This is catechism 1085. In the liturgy of the church, it is principally his own paschal mystery that Christ signifies and makes present. During his earthly life, Jesus announced his paschal mystery by his teaching and anticipated it by his, by his actions. When his hour comes, he lives out the unique event of history, which does not pass away. Jesus dies, is buried, rises from the dead, is seated at the right hand of the Father once for all. 
his paschal mystery is a real event that occurred in our history. And this is, my brothers and sisters, this is a turning point in our program tonight, right here. The paschal mystery is a real event that occurred in history, but it is unique. All other events happened once and then they pass away. Swallowed up in the past, the paschal mystery of Christ, by contrast, cannot remain only in the past because by his death, he destroyed death. And all that Christ is, all that he did, all that he suffered for men participates in the divine eternity and so transcends all time while being made present to them all. The event of the cross and resurrection abides and draws everything toward itself, everything before it, and everything after it. The sacraments, the mysteries are our participation in this reality. And it is a reality that transcends time because it participates in the divine reality. I'm going to share with you a quotation from Cardinal Jean Danielou. Listen to what he says. The sacraments carry on in our midst the great works of God in the Old Testament and in the New. For example, the flood, the passion, the ba and baptism show us the same divine activity as carried out in three different phases of sacred history. And these three phases are of God's action are all order the judgment at the end of time. For the fact is that the life of ancient Christianity was centered around worship and worship was not considered to be a collection of rites meant to sanctify secular life. The sacraments were thought of as the essential events of Christian existence and of existence itself as being the prolongation of the great works of God in the Old Testament and in the New. In them was inaugurated a new creation, which introduced the Christian even now into the kingdom of God. My brothers and sisters, mystagogical catechesis, the mystagogical catechesis of the church helps the newly baptized, the newly illumined, and all of us to see the same divine activity, to see the presence of God in all of creation, in the saving mysteries of the Old Testament and those of the new. Mystagogical catechesis is our being led to see through the eyes of God, the whole of creation transformed by him. Now, I have an extended quote to share with you. And then we are going to take a break to come back to the second part of our, our evening together. Okay. The quote is about a page long. It's from Father Stephen Freeman. But I do believe it is worth our attention. He says this. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Wherever he is, there is the beginning and the end of all things. Our common way of thinking about the world is marked by a linear passage of time. It moves from the past to the present to the future. And by cause and effect, everything is caused by something else. And we think of the two things together. A cause always happens before the effect. That being the case, we would never say that what someone is going to do tomorrow caused something to happen yesterday. I hope this seems obvious, he says. It is therefore not obvious, not at all obvious, when we hear... In the divine liturgy, the mass, saying something quite contrary to this arrangement. And here he refers to the, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, he said, which says this. It was you who brought us from non-existence into being. And when we had fallen, you raised us up again and did not cease doing all things until you had brought us up to heaven and had endowed us with your kingdom, which is to come. He says the clear meaning of this passage puts being brought up to heaven and being endowed with a kingdom in the past tense. Indeed, there's a complete jumble of tenses in the last phrase. Had endowed us the kingdom which is to come. And this is not unique to St. John. He is merely following languages already found in the New Testament from Ephesians. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when he, we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Something that seems clearly in the future is spoken of in the past and addressed to us in the present. He says, what is this? 
only the strange world of traditional eschatology, an understanding of the last things, sees Christ's ministry and the whole of his work as a single thing and continually present within our lives at this moment. This strange world is found within the liturgical and sacramental life of apostolic Christianity. Indeed, it is essential to it. The kingdom of God proclaimed by Christ was not an expectation of a soon coming political entity. It was the announcement of an immediate presence that was Christ himself. Christ says that he, what he says and does what he says because he himself is the company of the kingdom of God. And where the kingdom is, these things happen. The kingdom of God is a present tense manifestation of a future tense reality, which is actually an eternal reality that forms the future, the perfection, the telos of all creation united with God. The Christian life is an eschatological reality. The life that, that is ours in Christ has not yet been revealed, and yet it is a present reality. This same character runs through all of the sacraments. We are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ as into a present event. Holy unction, holy anointing is a manifestation of the kingdom to come in the same manner of Christ's miracles and so forth. This is among the reasons that Christianity is described as mystical. It means precisely what it prays. The proper heart of the Christian life is learning to live in communion with this eschatological reality, to participate now in the life of the kingdom, which is to come. This present tense participation in an eternal reality is how we die to ourselves, how we find our new life, how we enter into the kingdom, how we find the place of the heart, how we overcome the passions, how we eat the heavenly bread, how we trample down death, how we are justified and made holy. It is for this reason that the mass begins in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, or the, the, the divine liturgy. The priest goes to the altar, he begins. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages, to which you say, Amen. Let it be here and now the kingdom of God, in which we are incorporated into the love of the Holy Trinity, by which we give ourselves to the Father and to one another. Yes? Again, this all begins on the day of our baptism we, when we begin to see the kingdom through the symbols of the church for the first time. And when we enter into that kingdom and begin to live it now. But my brothers and sisters, we have a fundamental problem. And that is that we have as Christians become biblically and symbolically illiterate, unable to see and read the signs for what they are and therefore unable to be drawn up into the mystery that is communicated to us. And it is to that point that we will come again in the second part of our program this evening. When we come back, we're going to begin with a quotation from Cardinal Jean Danielou, and then we are going to dive literally into the baptismal font of the ancient church and begin to see for ourselves through the art and architecture of the church what the church was trying to communicate to those who have been baptized into her. Uh, let's get going, guys. We got a lot to cover here. Uh, and I, I apologize that I have, I have been doing a lot of uh, quote, quoting, but this stuff is mind blower and uh, too smart for Father Hezekiah. <laughs> I just got to read what other people understand because this is heavy duty stuff. The transcendent nature of the sacraments beyond time and space, such that what took place before and what takes place after becomes one in the moment of the gift of the divine liturgy in the sacraments of the church. And this is what Cardinal Jean Danielou talks about. I'm going to share this, my second kind of extended quote with you, not as long as the last one. And then we are going to pull up our slideshow and we're just going to have a big old party right inside the baptistry, if you don't mind. Okay, listen to this. And this was my point, right? That we have, we, we've, unfortunately, because we've lost our, our ability to understand the symbols, the sacraments now no longer communicating to your average Christian what is taking place. I have been to some pretty embarrassing baptisms in my day when the priest didn't know what to do with it because he didn't himself understand the meaning of the symbols that were presented before him to, to point to the realities of what were taking place. And so it becomes kind of a, a show, a, a joke, a time to take pictures and laugh. 
But my brothers and sisters, there's nothing to laugh about. There's plenty to feast about. Listen to Cardinal Jean Daniel. Because they are not understood, the rites of the sacraments often seem to the faithful to be artificial. It is only by discovering their meaning that the value of these rites will once more be appreciated. And there's meaning, and, and, and their meaning, the symbols that are used to convey the truth of what is taking place, Daniel Liu explains, is not subject to the whims of each interpreter. It constitutes a common tradition going back to the apostolic age. And what is striking about this tradition is its biblical character. Whether we read the instructions concerning the sacraments or look at the paintings in the catacombs, we are struck at once by the figures taken from Holy Scripture. Adam in paradise, Noah in the ark, Moses crossing the Red Sea. These are the images used for the sacraments. It is then the meaning and origin of this biblical symbolism that we must first make clear. That the realities of the old Testament are figures of those of the new is one of the principles of biblical theology. This science of similitudes between the two sacraments is what we call typology. And here we would do well, typology, T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y, typology. And here we would do well to remind ourselves of its foundation. For this is to be found in the Old Testament itself. At the time of the Babylonian captivity, the prophets announced to the people of Israel, that in the future, God would perform for their benefit deeds analogous to, and even greater than those that he performed in the past. So there would be a new flood in which the sinful world would be annihilated and a few men, a remnant, would be preserved to inaugurate a new humanity. There would be a new exodus in which by his power, God would set mankind free from the bondage of, to idols. There would be a new paradise in which God would introduce the people he had redeemed. The New Testament, therefore, reveals to us Jesus as the new Adam, with whom the time of the paradise of the future has begun. In him is already realized the destruction of the sinful world, of which the flood was a figure. In him is accomplished the true exodus, which delivers the people of God from the tyranny of the demons. And this is accomplished not only in the person of Christ, but also in the church because the church is our entrance into Christ. Thus, the gospel of John shows us that the manna was a figure of the Eucharist. The epistle, the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, which we'll look at in a minute, shows us that the cross in the Red Sea was a figure of baptism. And this means, furthermore, that the sacraments carry on in our midst the great works of God in the Old Testament and in the New. The sacraments carry on in our midst the Old Testament mysteries of God's salvation. Okay, I think I've made my point. When we are baptized, we enter into the eternal day of the Lord, and therefore we enter into all that the Lord has done for us. We are baptized into the same baptism that Noah was baptized into in the flood. Or I should say that the flood participates in the baptism of Christ, the same baptism to, in which we are baptized. My brothers and sisters, I hope that your head, as well as mine, is about to blow off right now. Have you ever wanted to stand on the side of the Red Sea and see Moses part the waters? Then go to a baptism, because it is the same divine activity taking place in both. And we're not talking about simple similarities, you know, nice coincidences. No, but real participation in the life of God. The same divine activity taking place in the flood of Noah and taking place in the baptismal font. The historical event taken up and made mysteriously, sacramentally present to us today. We're going to pull up some slides now to show you the whole purpose of, of, of the rest of our program is to show you this reality. What you're going to look at here, this is a church in New York City. It's called St. Vincent Ferrer. Can you believe this is in the United States? This is absolutely cosmic, this, this church. Um, and uh, it's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. But what I want to show you about this church in New York City is, is, uh, is something quite, quite beautiful. We're going to look over there to the bottom left corner of the screen. You'll see an octagon. That is the baptistry. Here it is, the front door of the baptistry and entrance in. The first thing I want you to notice, guys, is that you see the waves on the floor? When you enter into the baptistry itself, you enter into the mystery of baptism. 
But notice something else, which we're going to see over and over again. The baptistry itself is eight-sided. It's an octagon. The baptismal font itself is also eight-sided. It's an octagon. Okay? Now, we're going to flip to uh, uh, another uh, uh, church to see this same reality, and then I'm going to make my point. Okay? Um, Amy, this is, this is the, the Duomo, right? It's the Duomo in Florence. In Florence. It's the 1436. In Florence, Italy. You know, guys, if you want something good, you go to Italy, right? I mean, come on, please. All right. It's the doors here. Amy, you've probably seen these doors. It's those doors yes. that have salvation history on them, right? Yes. Right there. Mm-hmm. You guys see the baptismal, the baptistry is actually outside the church. Intentionally. Notice at St. Vincent Fair also, it was not inside the church. Most of our bapti- ba- uh, baptismal fonts are rolled up into the sanctuary, aren't they? Bad idea. No, the baptistry is at the entrance to the church. It is the gateway in. Listen to St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Henceforth, you are in the vestibule of the palace. May you soon be led into, into it by the king. You are already breathing the perfume of beatitude. You are already gathering the flowers of which your crowns will be woven. Notice also, it's also eight-sided here. Okay, here's, a, here's another church, Ravenna, right, Amy? Yep, it's the Orthodox Baptistry in Ravenna. What? The, um, the late 400s, early 500s. Okay, there you go. Mm-hmm. Guys, this is super early stuff. Okay, fourth century, you're talking the 300s. Super early. Notice octagon. What else do you notice in there? What else do you notice? Look at the walls. Look at the walls inside, covered in vines. It's a garden inside. Cardinal Jean Danielou says the leading into the baptistry signifies the entrance into the church, that is, into paradise itself. St. Cyril says, soon paradise will open to you, speaking to the catechumen. Okay, and notice again, it has eight sides to it. Why? Why? My brothers and sisters, the ancient baptistries were always, I say always, but for the most part, in fact, we're going to look at one that is not eight sided for a particular reason, but for the most part, Always eight-sided. Why? Why? The church fathers tell us, remind us, I should say, that Adam and Eve were created on what day of the week in the in 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 uh, in in Genesis? What day of the week was where Adam and Eve created in Genesis chapter one? Kevin's got it. Six days, the sixth day, right? Teresa, you got that? The sixth day of the week. Yes. Which is what day? It's Friday. Yes. It's Friday. The fathers of the church tell us that Jesus, being the creator of our first parents, went to the cross willingly on Good Friday so that the old Adam who came to life on that day might be put to death. And being the God of creation, he rested in the tomb on the great Sabbath day, the seventh day. Yes. And he rose from the dead on the first day of the week, but that first day was like no other, for on that day he entered our human nature into the eternal day of God, which they call the eighth day. It is for this reason that baptistries were always built in an octagon, to reveal to those who entered into them the reality that when we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ and given us a newness of life, the life of the resurrection in Christ. St. Peter makes this point very beautifully in his epistle. He says this, you are now saved by a baptismal bath, which corresponds to this exactly. And now stop for a second. The this he's talking about here is the flood of Noah. And what's so powerful about this, what's so beautiful about this, notice what he says, you are now saved, he says to the catechumen, the newly baptized. Do you want to understand what just happened to you? What just happened to you is the same thing that happened to Noah in the flood. You are now saved by a baptismal bath, which corresponds to this exactly. And the this he's talking about is very much that eighth day resurrection of Christ. And he points this out in his epistle. That eight in all were saved in the flood. Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives, eight in all were saved in the flood so that we would be prepared for the eighth day resurrection of Christ our God. And notice also the raven that is depicted in the story of the flood, a symbol of the darkness which hovered over the abyss at creation. St. Jerome says, do not think 
do not think that the flood subsided on its own. No, God sent the dove. And this I love about this icon. It says the Lord sends the dove to the ark. You see that at the top, right? We commonly think of Noah sending the ark, the dove out. But no, St. Jerome says, no, God sent the dove to the ark, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, which chased the darkness out and parted the waters that the dry land might appear again. And might man might come to do what Adam Eve failed to do, namely to worship God. We're going to turn to uh, another very ancient church, that of St. John the Lateran. I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Sure. Thanks, Father. So this is the baptistry at the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome. And I'm just going to use it to illustrate some of Father's points because it's the, so the Basilica at St. John Lateran is the oldest public church in the West. And I say that it's important because prior to this church, there were no public churches because Christianity was illegal. And so Christians couldn't own property. Um, so Constantine, as we know from Dr. Fipino, <laughs> uh, he, with the Edict of Milan, he legalizes Christianity in 313. And this is the first public Christian church. So just to underscore what Father said, you can see on the left-hand side, the Basilica of St. John Lateran. So you see this baptistry. It's within the Basilica complex, but it is, again, separate from, and Father made that point, and we saw with the Duomo as well, separate from the church. Um, also, it's an octagonal structure, the eight-sided, the eighth day of the new creation. So this is from the 300s. It was built under Constantine. Um, and I want you to just notice that the exterior is quite plain. Wouldn't you say? It's just a plain brick exterior. You could walk by it in the street and be like, ah, I'm not really sure what that is. <laughs> um, but the interior is quite beautiful. And we actually, it's, so the exterior is largely unchanged. The interior, um, we have a description from back when it was first created, and it really was like a shimmering jewel box inside. And so it was covered in mosaic decoration and mosaics, each little piece of glass, it's, they're called tesserae and they're set at different angles in the wall. And when the light hits the glass that um, communicates these beautiful mosaics, it creates this shimmering effect. So you can imagine walking in there back when it was first decorated and feeling like you're standing inside a jewel box. So I want to call your attention to this contrast between the exterior, plain, kind of boring brick exterior, and this beautiful interior, because it's symbolic. So it represents the Christian soul, the Christian soul who has been baptized, who on the outside, you could walk by that person on the street and they look quite ordinary, but inside, inside, this says something very powerful about our baptism. We're, within us dwells the Holy Trinity. Within us, the infused uh, gifts of the theological virtues, the gifts of the spirit, we're sealed in the spirit. So this is a beautiful representation, structurally, architecturally speaking, of the baptized Christian soul, plain on the outside and this beautiful ju jewel box within. Um, I also wanted to point out, as we're looking at sacred art and architecture within the context of early Christian baptism, that the Council of Trent referred to art as Ancilla Theologiae, which means the handmaiden of theology. So sacred art and architecture visually manifest the truths and mysteries of our faith, which are then celebrated in the liturgy. And when it's housed within a church or it makes up a part of the structure of the church, um, sacred art and architecture is meant to function in very deep harmony with the liturgical words and actions that are taking place therein. So it's important to remember Sacred art and architecture, it doesn't solely serve this didactic or decorative purpose. It's really made with the church's liturgy in mind. So we're going to keep that in mind. Um, and looking at this interior, before I read the quote, I just want to point out a couple things. 
there's eight purple columns. Do you see them? So eight purple columns, they're made of porphyry. Uh, Constantine brought them over from Egypt. Now, porphyry is an extraordinarily expensive material. Um, it was used mainly in imperial contexts because it's that royal purple color. For example, if you go into St. Peter's Basilica, you'll see this huge porphyry disc on the floor. It's where Charlemagne knelt for the Pope to crown him Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day in the year 800. So we see porphyry in imperial context. It, it indicates the fact that Constantine gave these eight columns. It indicates that this space is extraordinarily special. So above those columns, you'll see an octagon. It's a white marble architrave. Do you see it sitting on top of those columns? So on each side of that octagon, there's an inscription, a couplet. I put the whole quote right there for you to see it, but it's attributed to Leo the Great, not when he was Pope, but when he was archdeacon in Rome. So in the early, like 400s, maybe 430s. Um, and I wanted to read it to you because it gives a very early uh, glimpse into the Christian self-understanding of baptism and what was happening at this very spot. And once I read it, Father's going to go into a little bit more depth on some of the points that Pope Leo is bringing up in this inscription. So he says, and this is, remember, this is what's happening right here below, below the, the inscription underneath this octagon, which represents the eight days, the eighth day of the new creation, the, the people are going to be baptized right below this inscription. It says, a people consecrated to the heavens is here born from a fruitful seed, established by waters made fertile by the Spirit. Plunge in, O sinner, plunge. Remember, Father said baptism. Uh, it means plunge. Plunge in, O sinner, and be cleansed by the sacred flow. Whom it receives old, the waves return new. No differences remain among the reborn, whom one font, one spirit, and one faith make one. By a virginal birth, Mother Church bears these children. Those whom she conceives by God's breathing, she births by this stream. If you who wish to be innocent, wash in the bath, whether you are burdened by ancestral sin or your own. By ancestral sin, he means uh, Adam's sin, original sin. This is the fountain of life that cleanses the whole world. Its origin is Christ's wound. We have a lot of commentary on that from the fathers, the blood and water from the side of Christ. Hope for the heavenly kingdom once you are reborn in this spring. That happy life does not admit those who are only once born. Let neither the number nor kind of your sins frighten. Anyone reborn in the river will be holy. Beautiful. So with that, we move to the slide of the Red Sea. Ties in perfectly with this quote. We're going to take a look at some of the other images that are commonly depicted in baptistries in the ancient church. One of them is that which of the crossing, um, the crossing of the Red Sea, um, it, which was which I say is commonly used in the mystagogical catechesis of the church. You'll see here the depicted in the icon Moses, of course, and Miriam and the the Israelites coming out onto dry ground, and then Pharaoh and the Egyptians being dragged down into the water by the personification of the sea, who's, who's personified here as a demon for very good reasons, because for the ancient biblical peoples, the waters were the place of the tomb. It was during the flood that God's the, the, the sinful people died in the waters. It was during the time of the Red Sea, the cross of the Red Sea, that Pharaoh and the Egyptians, the enemies of God, were drowned in those waters. So water becomes for the ancient Christians, the early Christians, and for the ancient biblical peoples, a symbol, uh, a, a symbol of, of, of the tomb, but also a symbol of the womb of the church in which God's people are reborn. And this is why, this is why um, it is preferred by the church that baptism be done by immersion. Okay, Ch take a look at this at this image of a priest baptizing a baby into the waters. Literally, the child is buried in the waters of baptism. So that, and here's an adult being baptized, I believe in the Jordan River. So that they might also be reborn 
to a newness of life. I'm going to share with you this quotation. Well, this, well, this, well, this image is, this is actually me baptizing my son, Vito. I love this. I love this picture. So listen to the, listen to the catechism, paragraph 1239. The essential rite of the sacrament follows. Baptism, properly speaking, it signifies the it signifies and actually brings about death to sin. Yes, burial in the waters of baptism, entry and entry into the life of the Holy Trinity through configuration to the Paschal mystery of Christ. Baptism is performed in the most expressive way by triple immersion in the baptismal waters. That's not to say pouring on of water is somehow invalid or like that. But no, the church prefers to baptize according to the ancient practice of immersion because it shows the person, it show, is a symbol itself of the reality that the person is dying, is being buried in the waters of baptism, as St. Paul says, so that they might come to a newness of life, being born again, being born anothen. Look, St. Paul picks up this theme um, also in 1 Corinthians. Look at this, chapter 10. Again, this, this image of the crossing of the Red Sea as a mystagogical catechesis for the one who has just been baptized so that they might understand what has taken place. Chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. I want you to know, brethren, that our brothers were all under the cloud, our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea. What? baptized in the old testament into moses what's he well, i mean saint paul what are you talking about let me tell you what he's talking about i want you to stand with me for a moment on the edge of the red sea with pharaoh and the egyptians the greatest army the world had ever known bearing down on you moses strikes the red sea and the waters part but my brothers and sisters you think about it for a moment when the walls of the sea parted, you still have the distance of the sea to cross. Visually, the two sides of the water would have collided, would have come together in your vision. They didn't see dry land on the other side. When they took their first step into the Red Sea, they took their first step into certain death. And in order to do that, they had to die to themselves and entrust themselves completely to Moses. He plunged into Moses in the Red Sea. Do you want to know the faith that is required to come to the baptismal font? That's it. And that's the catechesis of the church regarding faith. To say, look, learn from Moses and the Israelites, for you are entering into an even greater mystery than that. It is the same divine activity taking place. And taking place here, you are being freed from slavery, not to Pharaoh, but slavery to sin, slavery to death, slavery to the devil. And in that moment, we die to ourselves and we are given the possibility of newness in Christ. We're going to pull up a very ancient church to make this point. Yes. Amy, jump in here and explain what we're seeing. Sure. So again, to underscore Father's point about this entrance into Christ's passion, death, and resurrection in baptism, I wanted to show you this. I'm so excited about it because it's actually, uh, it was restored at the Yale Art Gallery. So you can see this in person in the States, which is really neat. What you're looking at is the oldest surviving Christian house church. And I've zoomed in on a picture of the baptistry in that oldest surviving Christian house church. So this is from 235 AD. It's from a, a city called Dura Europis, which is in modern day Syria. And what's interesting is that this particular city, it was an outpost of the Roman Empire. And the Romans were around 250 AD, were anticipating an attack by the Sasanian Empire. And so what they did in order to fortify the city was they backfilled the walls of the city with tons of dirt um, and created this embankment over all of the structures that lined the city wall. And so people call this the Pompeii of the desert <laughs> because the Sasanians came and they did attack. They took the city, but then they left it abandoned. 
And so for hundreds of years, it was covered in sand and only in the 1930s was it rediscovered. And when they rediscovered it, one of the structures along the city wall was a house church. So we have some of the earliest Christian art and architecture right here, Dury Ropus, it's a great example. Um, what we can see that underscores some of Father's points is, well, first of all, as I had mentioned, Christians couldn't own property. Christianity at this time, it was an age of persecution. It was illegal. So a family in the Christian community would privately, secretly, without the government knowing, right, um, offer their home, open their home, and the home would be renovated in order to accommodate the Christian mysteries. So you can actually, we could tell that on the left-hand side, that's the space for the mass. Uh, it's pointing to the east, oriented to the east. And there was actually a wall knocked down to renovate the house so there would be enough space for all of the people gathering at the Divine Liturgy. And then on the other side, we see the baptistry. What's really interesting about this is that you have to enter and go through the baptistry. If you're going into the baptistry, you, you enter, go through the baptistry, and then only then would you be able to even get to the assembly room where the mass is celebrated. So there's this symbolism there that this is a sacrament of initiation into the Christian mysteries, as Father was saying. Another important thing to note is that Father was mentioning Romans 6, this death uh, with Christ and into Christ. We see that the, um, this very early baptistry is actually in the shape of a tomb. So the bottom part is large enough. It's a tub that would be large enough to uh, accommodate a recumbent man or woman. Um, and it's covered by an archosolium. So if you, I don't know how many here have visited the catacombs in Rome, but in the, or seen pictures, but the catacombs, you see a lot of loculi, which are shelves and the bodies would be laid in the shelves. But certain rooms called cubiculum, they contained these archosolia. So people would have immediately at this, in this day and age, recognized this as a funerary structure. So as you're entering into that baptismal font, you recognize that this is like your tomb. You're entering with Christ into his passion and dying to self, to the old self, and rising to new life in baptism, incorporated into Christ. And that's why it's also important that this, uh, these Christian mysteries of initiation were often, most often, celebrated at the Easter Vigil. So an initiants would begin, you know, Ash Wednesday, beginning of Lent, the neophyte would be, you know, taken to learn the Christian mysteries over the course of Lent. And then at this culminating moment of the Easter vigil, they would enter into Christ's passion, death, and resurrection through this sacrament of initiation in their baptism. So again, that just reiterates what Father had to say about um, the dying and rising with Christ that we experience in baptism. Amy, that point that this whole the whole death and resurrection, which is central, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's another image of we're gonna look at two more things in the baptistry real quick, and then we're gonna enter in the church. We got ten minutes more in our program. I know we're going late tonight, but but uh, but about two more images in the baptism, and then we're gonna go into the church itself. But the next the next image is commonly depicted in the ancient baptistries is that of, uh, of Jonah in the belly of the whale. Many of you know this story. Do you remember what Jonah was doing when he was? cast into the waters and swallowed by the fish he was running away from god's will like like who else hid from god oh like adam like adam exactly so he's thrown by his by his shipmates he's thrown into the waters yeah the tomb yes he's swallowed it. how many days does he remain in the water how many days has he swallowed how many days does he remain in the belly of the whale three so jonah becomes this image this type of christ who then is resurrected from the dead, who comes forth to do the will of God. Yeah, the, the, the next image we're going to look at is that one of my favorites. Let me tell you right now, this is one of my favorites. Check out this, again, commonly depicted in the ancient baptistries is Moses striking the rock. What I love about this image is that, notice that it has the head of Christ at the top of the rock. Why? 
Open your Bibles back with me to 1 Corinthians. Listen to this. Listen to what St. Paul says. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. And all ate the same supernatural food. And all drank the same supernatural drink. For they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. What? Did St. Paul just say that the Israelites in the desert received the Holy Eucharist, Peter? They drank from the supernatural rock, and the rock was Christ. The same divine activity taking place in the Old Testament and the New and the Divine Liturgy today. My brothers and sisters, holy shnikes mystagogical catechesis is literally of another of another world this is the ancient teaching of the church regarding baptism and all of these images of course all of these old testament images ultimately find their 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 source their purpose their beginning their end in the baptism of christ saint cyril of jerusalem says this Then you were led to the holy pool of divine baptism as Christ taken down from the cross was laid in the tomb already prepared. Three times were you plunged in the waters and came forth signifying Christ's burial for three days like Jonah. Yes. By this action, you died and you were born. And for you, the saving water was at once a grave and a womb of a mother. Notice underneath Jesus's feet is Uh, Two boards, you see that? Two planks, and they're placed crossing each other. The bronze doors of Hades, broken down at their entrance by Christ, now in the form of a cross, and underneath the bronze doors of Hades, the serpent. Cyril goes on. The dragon was in the waters and was taking the Jordan into its gullet. But as the heads of the dragon had to be crushed, Jesus, having descended into the waters, chained fast the strong ones so that we might gain power to tread on scorpions and serpents. Life came so that henceforth a cur might be put on death, so that all who have received salvation might say, O death, where is your victory? Coming forth from the baptismal waters, the first thing that the, 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 the newly baptized sees is the icon of Christ recreating the world you see the abyss down below the child sees for the first time now the new creation this is uh, a beautiful icon uh in a church in virginia and i show this to you um uh because notice on the left hand side the angel on the left hand side notice he has in his hand the fiery sword which guards the way to paradise And now the sword is lifted. And you see the gate of paradise is written right above his head. You can say the gate of paradise. Yeah, exactly. On both sides. A little hard to see. The angel now with the lifted sword. We've got one more image of this of icons are depicted in the dome of the church. I love this. Amy, which church is this from? That's the baptistry in Padua, Italy. In in Padua. I love this because the person comes forth from the baptismal font and is immediately incorporated into the church yeah all the saints right the church being the revelation on earth of the eternal church the father son and holy spirit okay into this we are um we are we are incorporated in the early church it would be at this moment that the newly baptized were picked up literally and carried in procession into the church to see the revelation of the restoration of all things. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, thou hast driven us out of paradise, and now thou dost call us back. Thou hast stripped us of the fig leaves, and thou hast clothed us once more with a robe of honor. Henceforth, when thou callest Adam, he will no longer be ashamed. Having recovered his filial assurance, he will come out in the full light of paradise. We're going to pull up here a church, which um, uh, a, a Gothic church. Amy, I'm going to turn over to you for just a moment. 
Sure. Yeah. So this is a high Gothic French cathedral. And just to illustrate Father's point of uh, going through this sacrament of baptism and it being initiated into the restored paradisical garden, I wanted to show you that the um, this restoration of paradise is visualized in the columns of the church that stretch upwards like trees forming an arbor um, over the initiant. So actually the next slide, we see an artist's kind of rendering of this beautiful meaning of the columns. This is in order to indicate that this is paradise restored. Beautiful. Listen to St. Ephraim the Syrian. I took my stand halfway between awe and love. A yearning for paradise invited me to explore it, but awed its majesty restrained me from my search. With wisdom, however, I reconciled the two. I revered what lay hidden and made it, meditated on what was revealed. The aim of my search was to find being prophet. The aim of my silence was to find comfort. Adam had been, had been most pure in that fair garden, but he became leprous and repulsive. Because the serpent had breathed on him, the garden cast him from its midst, all shining. It thrust him forth. The high priest, the exalted one, beheld him. Cast out from himself, he stooped down and came to him. He cleansed him with hyssop and led him back to paradise. Adam had been naked and fair, but his diligent wife labored and made for him a garment covered with stains. The, gar the garden, seeing him thus vile, drove him forth. But through Mary, Adam had another robe, which adorned the thief. And when he had become resplendent in Christ's promise, the garden looking on embraced him in Adam's place. I was just going to bring yeah, up. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. San Clemente really underscores your point. So yeah, there San you Clemente go. In Rome, the first traces of this particular church are from the fourth century. So this built in layers on top of each other. This particular church is from 1123. And Father's going to go ahead and talk about that tree of life cross in the apse. This is one of my favorite churches in all of Rome. And we're going to go a closer up look in the apse because now the, the newly baptized has entered into the church. And now all is revealed. The garden is restored. That which was before has been made present now because it has been taken up into the divine eternity. And here you see depicted in the apse, Jesus on the cross, but the cross is now turned into the tree of life from which Adam and Eve were meant to eat and live forever. And so you see coming forth from the cross, the vines, the branches of the tree. Yes. And in the midst of those branches now, Amy, show us what they're looking at. Sure, at the base of the cross, if you look on the right-hand uh, side, you'll see four streams running down. Do you see them? Yeah. So those are the four rivers of paradise that are described in Genesis and the deer that are drinking from those streams. So Augustine tells us that during the uh, uh, sacrament of baptism, the neophytes, they would uh, process towards the font praying the 42nd Psalm, which says as a deer yearns for running streams, so I yearn for you, O Lord. So there's this deep sense of um, reincorporation into paradise. And on the left-hand side, you see people going about their daily business, um, a monk writing and uh, someone with the, the farm animals. So there's this idea that everything, all of creation is restored and caught up into the life that stems from this tree of life. What I, I love about this is that the people, the people are almost like fruit hanging mm -hmm. on the tree. We, we become ourselves the Eucharist. Yes, the fruit of the tree of life so that others might come to us and receive this gift of life. There's just quickly three sides that we're going to show. Christ, of course, is the center of all of this. Good theology, my brothers and sisters, is always Christocentric. Jesus says, you came to this water to drink. But if you come to me, I am the source of living water. It is Jesus who heals us in baptism. It is Jesus who is the source of healing in baptism. Yes, he is the one who brings about the miracle of baptism. It is he who heals the blind man and heals our blindness so that we might see again with God. It is Jesus who healed the, uh, the, the paralytic. 
And so he comes to heal us in baptism that we might once again live with God. And that life, and that life is always God's life. We're going to pull down this, the, the slideshow now, guys, and, um, and, 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 and close the program with this at this point. We who have entered into the kingdom of God, we who have entered into the life of the Trinity, now live his life. This is the Christian life that is given to us. This is why the church is pro-life, yes? Not because Paul VI woke up one day in the Vatican and decided we shouldn't contracept. No! The church is pro-life because God has lived a life of loving communion from all eternity, pouring out his life in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are made, we are remade in baptism into his image and likeness. And now we are called to do the greatest thing, the most amazing gift that anyone could ever conceive of. And that is to live the life of God himself. To be, as St. Peter says, partakers of the divine nature. To be life bearers. To be the fruit of the tree of life so that those who come and eat of us, that participate in us who have participated in Christ might come to know the one who is life himself. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Father. Father, you, you talked about baptism and you and Amy showed all these beautiful baptistries, but um, the reality that we see in our church today is, is not quite that, right? Like the uh, baptism <laughs> take place in a different part. We don't do full immersion baptisms. I know. Um, I know this could be like a separate talk in itself, but can you either speak a little bit to that or give us further resources? How can I, we understand what's going on? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I will. I, okay. What are you going to say? I got to tell you, I got to be honest. We are living through a liturgical nightmare. And Amy, I think you would agree. We're living through an architectural and artistic nightmare. In yes. The church. <laughs> okay. So, so the, no, the best thing for you to do as a Christian, is to get yourself familiar with what is true and good so that when you do encounter it, you will want it. There are places in the world in which baptisms are done and liturgy is done in general with splendor and glory. And I suggest you get yourself to one of those places if you possibly can. Now, in your average parish, you know, in the middle of... Uh, you know, nowhere, uh, you know, I, 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 what can I say? Thank God. Thank God we have uh, access to internet and things like that, in which we can do research. We can see, and we can learn because I'll tell you right now for me, myself, I first read about what we talked about tonight in a book. This is the book. I had to tape the cover. I've had it for about 25 to 30 years. It's called, it's called The Bible and the Liturgy, Cardinal Jean Danielou. We will link it in your post-event email. Fantastic. Fantastic. Danielou was a, a, a contemporary. Well, I mean, he was old when Pope Benedict was young, but they were in the same school. You know, they were working together. And uh, the guy blew my mind. And I was re reading about this as you are learning about it at the ICC. So that when I came to encounter it for the first time, when I, I walked into a, a church in Virginia, that was a very traditional, very beautiful church. I says, Oh Lord, it's not dead and gone in a book. It's very alive and well. Yeah. So I would just, I would, I would say, don't despair. Don't lose hope. Christ is in charge of the church. If things are bad where you are, or if you're frustrated with what's going on or pities for Christ is in charge of his church. You need to get yourself prepared for glory. And to do that, you must be well-formed in the faith. And to do that, I really recommend, if you like this talk, you're into this kind of uh, material, Cardinal Jean Daniel Luz, The Bible and the Liturgy. Or you could just move to Father Hezekiah's Church, Sacramento, California, where we still celebrate baptism just like this. Catholics, there's no, there's no such thing as a private baptism. You are the family being baptized into. So if somebody's being baptized in your church, don't absent yourself. Go and experience baptism. Be there regularly for baptism. So welcome the new members into the community of faith, into the kingdom of God, in which you are already a member. Father, this next question coming in, uh, I think it came in a little earlier when you were talking about uh, RCIA. This person asks, if you're suggesting that we not teach the catechism in RCIA, is it too soon? 
Or are you suggesting that we're just missing this mystagogical part afterward? And if that's the case, what do, what do we do? Well, we certainly, okay. Uh, every single catechist tonight knows that mystagogical catechesis, as it's called for in the RCIA program, which is supposed to follow baptism, does not exist. If it exists, call me. I don't know, I don't know where it exists, except that it is a, a, an invitation to go ahead and make the coffee for the coffee social in the hall. That's become mystagogical catechism in the church, okay? Why? Because we've turned our RCIA programs into theological, uh, a year-long theology course. That's not what they're supposed to be. What is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be a, a, a understanding of, of, uh, of salvation history, Bible study, yes? so that you know what God has done and then come to re realize and recognize what he's going to do in your life. See, I'm just going to jump in here with this one for Amy um, from Sue. She asks if, uh, Amy, if you have any recommended books or texts uh, to look into to study early Christian uh, art and archaeology. Sure. Thanks, Sue. I'm actually holding one. <laughs> So this is um, a Notre Dame professor, Robin Jensen, J-E-N-S-E-N, -E -E and it's baptismal imagery in early Christianity. Um, she dives into further detail about these different themes that we touched upon, such as uh, this entering into Christ's death so as to enter into his resurrection. For example, she talks about this progression of uh, the fonts, the baptismal fonts from very early Christianity looking like tombs. And then a little bit later, they were cruciform in shape. So they were actually shaped like a cross and you would descend the steps down in for full body immersion. You would descend the steps in the West um, of that cruciform shape, be baptized, and then ascend the steps again out of that cruciform baptistry um, to the east. So there's this symbolism of um, the west and the east and meeting Christ and his resurrection in the east. So she does a, a great job of looking into um, that background, I'd say. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. That would be a good starting point, Robin Jensen, uh, baptismal imagery in early Christianity. I don't know if ha Father has any recommendations. Uh, no, well, no I, 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 on, on the art and architecture part of it, not, not exactly. I don't, except to come on pilgrimage with us to the Holy Land. That'd be cosmic. Uh, <laughs> but I will say this, that if possible, I will talk to my staff tomorrow. Would it be possible for us to do a live video feed of the baptism, which I'm going to baptize this baby on Sunday morning? A great idea. Which would be kind of cool because... Because in the Byzantine East, much of what we talked about still is alive and well. And, it, and it, look, I'm not trying to sell Byzantine Christianity. What I'm trying to sell is apostolic Christianity, which was true both East and West. It was very similar. I mean, w what was taking place? But unfortunately, today, as our as our questioner made the point, it's like in my parish, what you're describing ain't going on, and uh, and, I, and 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 it's unfortunate. But there are places. There are good, faithful, traditional places, the fraternity of St. Peter and other places like that, good, faithful priests in dioceses that are serious about the faith, that, uh, that realize that, that baptism is much more than a, a cute party to laugh about, and uh, there's serious business going on. Go ahead, Teresa. All right. It, it kind of touches with one of the other people who asked a question. Um, you were talking about the mystagogy and uh, that I don't remember which person you were quoting, but he was talking about there was a new death, there was a new exodus, there was a new baptism. Daniel so is the mystagogy or mystagogical catechesis meant to be like that, that journey in exodus into the promised land? Now, this is the whole same divine activity business, guys. The fingerprint of the artist looks the same. So it's, it's not Jesus. This is the pro, this is the fundamental problem. We think of Jesus as a bandaid and the church is a bandaid. The devil won. So Jesus had to change the plan and invent a new religion. He didn't invent a new religion. You just don't recognize the symbols. Yes. 
the, the, the flood, I'm going back to the quote. It's right here. The flood, the passion, and baptism show us the same divine activity. Bluey. It's, 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 it's a, it, it is a completely, why? Because Christ has taken up into the eternal, into eternal life, historical realities, which for us take place over time and therefore makes them present sacramentally, mysteriously, really present. Today, Christ is born. Today, Christ is risen from the dead. You know? Your baptism and Christ's baptism are one reality. This is what the church fathers say. They ask this question. Why was Christ baptized? If baptism cleanses from sin, why was Christ baptized? He's without sin. And they answer it this way. They say, Christ was baptized because he is God. And whatever God touches, he sanctifies. He makes holy. He touched he, he, he touch, uh, bread and wine at the, at, the, at the Last Supper. And he makes an, a, a communication of, of eternal life, of his divine life. Yes? He touches marriage at the wedding at Cana, and it becomes a sacrament, a place in which we grow in the life of God and come to salvation. He touches water at the Jordan River, and he sanctifies it. So that water might again do what it was meant to do. And that is not just give bodily life, but give the resurrected life to give spiritual life, real life, eternal life. Yes. The second reason Jesus was baptized was that he might enter mysteriously, sacramentally into the tomb of the Jordan River and there meet his adversary of old and bind his power so that he may no longer have dominion over us. And the third reason Jesus was baptized was to meet each one of us on the day of our baptism, crossing 2,000 years of salvation history. The priest stands in persona Christi, not only at the altar, but at the baptismal font, that my hands might be the hands of Jesus Christ reaching into the baptismal font and into the Jordan River at the same time. And draw forth this child, saving them from the tomb, the hands of Christ, and giving newness of life. I have no idea what you just asked. I completely forgot your question, but that's my answer. Let's take one more question on screen and then go out uh, here. So let's give that next question to uh, Monique. Monique, go ahead. So what I want to know is when did the Western side of the church um, give up a immersion and give up like building uh octagonal uh baptistries and just do the little ladinky pour the water on thing well first of all they didn't those that are in a parish in you know god forsaken nowhere when you walk in your church you look at your baptismal font how many of you at your baptismal font has eight sides to it have you ever noticed it It, they haven't well, mine was round when I grew up in my church. Well, so is the baptistry in the in the uh, in Bethlehem in the church that Constantine built. It doesn't mean that a round baptistry is somehow heretical. The point is that you probably have been walking by your. How many of you have walked by your baptismal font about four thousand times and never realized? So the, it's there, but it's latent. It's it's sleeping. Yes, it's sleep. You know, there's so much in our church. I'm going to, I, 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 I got to go to Isaiah, not, not Isaiah, but, um, but Ezekiel, but, but while I'm going to Ezekiel, I'm going to say that, uh, the church inside is, 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 is designed into two, two major sections, right? The holy place and, and the, and the nave of the church, right? The body of the church, the, the nave in, in, in ancient Christianity was, was always understood as the bridal, cha- the, 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 the chamber of the groom, and the church, the nave of the church is the, is, the, is the chamber of the bride. And it is divided by, in the Eastern tradition, what's called an iconostasis. It's a wall with gates in it that go into the holy place. Okay? Um, and, and over time, that wall, which historically, the, the, there's the dome, right? And, then, and because the dome is a symbol of heaven... Um, uh, the church wanted always the early Christian wanted to make it big, bigger and bigger and bigger as possibly they could. And so they would put a architecturally a beam across it. Yes, the rude beam. You know about this, Amy. 
the rood beam to structurally uphold the dome because it got so big they needed a, a, a structure piece there. And on top of that, a simple cross called the rood in English, uh, the rood beam. And over time, to hold up the rood beam as the domes become bigger, posts were put underneath it and the thing was decorated. In the east, it was filled in completely. But in the west, the flying buttress was invented. So the rood beam became unnecessary. Okay, but because of its theological importance about the division between the sanctuary and the nave, between the groom's chamber and the bride's chamber, it wasn't gotten rid of. It was dropped down and becomes today what is our altar rail, a beam with posts holding it up. And if you notice, the gate of the altar rail always has a cross on it, and it's a simple cross. It's the rude beam, the rude cross. And between the bridal chamber and the, the groom's chamber and the bride's chamber, now the divine liturgy takes place. The groom always enters in the bridal chamber for the bride to, to enter into marriage, yes? And so communion is always brought from the holy table out to the people. It's not communicated inside the holy place, it's communicated outside to the people. So the bride might receive the gift of the bridegroom, yeah? So it's there, it's just latent. It's, it's the sleeping, resurrected Christians. You know, we have a dear friend in, uh, in, in, in Virginia who was a member of, the, of uh, at, at St. Mary of Sorrows. For our members of St. Mary of Sorrows in Virginia, you had an ugly church. Let's just admit it. 1970s disaster. But they built a glorious church for the glory of God. Get yourselves on your architectural committee. <laughs> for the restoration of all things in Christ. Ezekiel chapter 36, for I will take you from the nations and gather you from the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle you with clean water and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will, I will put within you and I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. Sprinkling with water at baptism is, is, a, is an apostolic practice. It's there in, it's there in Ezekiel. It's not to say that it's not valid or it's not good or it doesn't do what it does. No, that's not the point. But it doesn't communicate this, this fullness of death and burial with Christ. And so the church prefers immersion. Yes? Now let, let us restore in our churches a proper baptism. And you, members of the Institute of Catholic Culture, do it. Get that baptismal font off the wheels sitting inside the sanctuary Get it back out to the vestibule to start with. That's where baptisms happen. And then put in a permanent baptismal font. Is properly prepared to communicate symbolically the truths of the faith. That's it. Well, fa Father, I, on behalf of everybody here and everybody who was with us before and, and perhaps had to leave, but thank you so much for, I know you put hours and hours of preparation into this lecture. So thank you for, uh, for all of that going into our time this evening. Father, could you uh, send us out with a prayer this evening? Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you who promised that when two or three are gathered in your name, you would be here among us. We ask you now to be here present with us, to send down your Holy Spirit, to enlighten our minds and our souls, that in all things we might glorify your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.